So good morning, good evening to everybody who has joined us for this very exciting interaction that we're going to have today uh, with uh, Stephen Vogel. Uh, quite quite uh, uh, interestingly, this is uh, one of the most interesting topics that I've actually dwelled into uh, into the into in the last six months, and I was so fascinated. Wow. Uh, yes, Stephen. Glad uh, to hear that. Oh, I said like this is one of the most fascinating topics that I've actually dwelled into. Uh, in the last uh, six months. And uh, this was uh, and how I got to know Steve was that I was teaching a course at Stanford on rebalancing economic systems uh, with his friend, uh, Richard Dasher. And that's when I came across this book and we, I was so fascinated by what he had actually written. Uh, I must say that it is probably one of the finest works that I've actually read in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I think it's a must read for everybody across the board. Uh, anybody who's working in either businesses, governments, or students, they should really look at the proposition that Steve is actually making. Uh, but uh, of course, beyond that, I think I should introduce Steve to you. Uh, Steve is uh, chair of the political economy program at uh, Berkeley, uh, and of course, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. He has published a number of books. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the foremost books is Market Craft. Then he's also written a book on called Japan, Japan Remodel. And then, of course, another one, the political economy leader and things. And, of course, he's got a number of awards. Uh, he's actually got awards in Japan. He's got uh, awards from Northern California Association of Phi Beta Kappa Teaching, excellent awards, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, of course, he's been a columnist with Newsbeat. Uh, and uh, he, he is a PhD from uh, University of California, Berkeley. And he actually did his undergrad program from Princeton. So that's where what who Steve is. But Steve, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's such an honor to have you on the Thinkers Dialogue. Uh, and oh, I'm uh, delighted really to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Steve. So we'll quickly dive into the conversation uh, here today, Steve. Uh, you know, like it's it's a fascinating world that we are actually living in uh, right now, uh, and things have changed so dramatically for us in the last uh, one year. So just a personal question. Uh, how do you really see how things have changed for you uh, in the last 12 to 14 months since the start of the pandemic? Well, the pandemic has been a shock for everyone, obviously in a very material way in terms of the damage to our health, the damage to our economy, uh, the damage to relationships between people and countries. But I think it's also been a kind of a wake up call in terms of political economy and public policy. And uh, maybe we didn't need reminding of the importance of a capable government, but we got one anyway, um, because in the moment of pandemic, you know, the free market can't deliver the goods, right? It can't um, get you uh, the protective gear that you need for your hospitals. It can't get the tests. It can't get the vaccines allocated. For that, you need a competent and capable government. You need planning. Um, you need institutions. And so it's been fascinating because the countries that you might have expected to be best prepared. I mean, the United States, not only did we expect it would be that we were proclaiming ourselves prior to the pandemic the country that would be best prepared for a pandemic. Um, that did not turn out to be the case. Um, and other uh, countries, you know, uh, have, have, have performed much better, you know. Uh, there's lots of examples, but you know, Taiwan, Korea, um, these are countries that really contained uh, the pandemic in incredibly successfully. And, you know, it's hard to see a clear pattern because it doesn't seem to be democracy versus authoritarianism. You've got capable and incapable democracies. You've got capable and incapable authoritarian governments. Uh, but there are some patterns in terms of uh, the government's ability to um, plan, to um, allocate resources, um, and, uh, and basically the capability or the capacity of the, of the bureaucracy. All of those things seem to have helped countries that have those features seem to have fared better in this pandemic. So Stephen, you know, like you're making a very important point here and that takes me back to your body of work. Uh, in fact, wherein you've actually said that the fundamental aspect that you say is that markets should be governed. 
And this is exactly what you have said here in your statement as well, that uh, uh, in a freer market, this might not have been the right solution. So that is what you're, you're really hitting at the very aspect of the capitalistic world, wherein they believe that it is less fair uh, or um, it is just, it has to be free markets and so on and so forth. So how do you really look at this uh, per se? Like, could, could we go deeper into this? Yeah, I mean, I would take it a step further in the sense that I would say not only should all markets be governed, but all markets are governed, right? There's no alternative to that, right? And so, uh, so the question is not whether to govern them or not govern them, it's whether you're gonna govern them badly or you're gonna govern them well. And when I say govern, I mean very broadly. So that includes laws and regulations, you know, by the government, literally. It also includes business practices. It also includes social norms, right? Any market in the real world is governed by all of these institutions. Um, and so the free market is, is a fiction, right? And some people might say, well, there's never any perfect free market, but it's still an ideal that we should try to realize or something. But I'm saying throw all that out, right? And recognize that all markets are governed, that analytically we have to think about, right? We have to try to understand how they're governed in the real world. And in terms of prescription, in terms of policy, we have to think about how can we govern them better, right? I mean, one way to think about this is the alternative to government regulation is not a free market. The alternative to government regulation is a, is a market that's privately governed, right? Or self-regulated, which means uh, th that it's laden with collusion and fraud, right? And imbalances of power, right? So that's not necessarily uh, such a great thing, right? And in fact, it's the government that tries to force companies to compete, right? To create a competitive market. Because of, as Adam Smith noted very rightly, if you get a bunch of business people together, um, they would rather collude than compete, right? So it's actually the government that pushes them towards competition. So in that sense, a dynamic competitive markets are the product of government regulation, not the absence of it. So Stephen, like when you're saying that, of course, uh, competition is instilled by governments, uh, there, there's also been some very interesting stories wherein uh, governments have actually devoided competition by protecting markets or whatever. How, how would you really look at that proposition? Of course, exactly. Um, one way to think about it quite simply is that you, if you can take government regulation and you can kind of divide it into two big categories, anti-competitive and pro-competitive, right? And so the free market world is, is, is forgetting about pro-competitive regulation, just thinking about anti-competitive regulation, which to be concrete would be like uh, uh, limits on entry, right? Saying you can't enter a certain business or fixing prices. Those would be anti-competitive regulations, exactly what you were just describing, the government protecting incumbents. So that is a very real thing, right? But what I'm saying is that there's a whole other category of regulations which are pro-competitive, like antitrust policy, right? Or all of the kind of like the market infrastructure, corporate law, you know, labor regulation, financial regulation. These are actually part of a regulatory infrastructure that empowers markets rather than constrains them. So I'm not saying that governments don't protect incumbents sometimes, or that some regulation shouldn't be get, gotten rid of. But I am saying that you have to look at that empirically, right? Rather than just assume, for instance, that regulation is a constraint on freedom, that regulations are a constraint on markets. Maybe, but that's something you have to look at empirically, right? And you have to separate out, you know, pro-competitive from anti-competitive regulation. That's fascinating. So pro-competitive and anti-competitive anti uh, regulation. Uh, but it, it leads to a very important question. And uh, I'm asking that question because we see that in India all the time. And the debate is going to be whether government has any business to be in business. Uh, should they actually have private sector enterprises? And if they have private sector enterprises, should we actually sell them or not? Uh, how do you really create a picture of this sort? Like, how do you really put your theory into this kind of thinking? Should government be in business? Should they sell off their stakes? 
Should they privatize? Is it going to be better? And government should just take the role of really creating uh, the right regulation. So whether government should actually be in business or not is, you know, is, is an interesting and big question. And India versus the United States is, I think, is a great contrast, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm no expert on India, but if you were to tell me that there are some businesses that are run by the government that would be much better managed by the private sector in India, I don't think I would fight you very hard, right? I would say that's, that's very real, that's very possible. But actually the debate in the United States is, is heading the other direction in the sense that we're starting to think like in some areas, not that the government should take over an industry, but that having a public option can actually be a positive thing, right? So um, an easy example would be health insurance, right? Where we have these uh, kind of fabricated marketplaces uh, that were created under Obamacare. Um, and there's a lot of people arguing that you could still have that marketplace, but maybe you should have one public player, right? Competing with private players, right? Mm -hmm. And that that would, um, that would kind of make those uh, markets actually more dynamic, right? Because you'd have, you'd have one public player and, and, you could, and you could have that competition. Just because you have private ownership doesn't, I mean, public ownership doesn't mean you, you don't have competitive markets. Again, that's an empirical question. Um, another example we're talking about in the United States is our financial system. You know, a lot of countries have postal um, postal finance systems, like Japan had a, has a it's now privatized, uh, but it created access. You know, uh, incredible universal access to the financial system, which is a huge problem in the United States now because people who are poor don't necessarily even have access to the financial system in a country as rich as the United States. So I guess this is a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, but the uh, first point I'll make is that it's not obvious that private ownership or public ownership is necessarily always more efficient. I think that the more important thing relative to ownership is actually the market competition, right? Is it, is it a competitive market? Right. And you could, you know, for example, there's been studies between, you know, public uh, bustling companies and pi private ones. And it's not obvious which one is more efficient. You know, it, it, the results come out differently depending on how they're structured, depending on on how they're run. Um, so um, and there's certain things that the public sector does better. I would argue that insurance is one of them in some areas, like if you think about health insurance. Uh, because you have a much bigger pool or like the social security system, the pension system in the United States, that can actually be quite efficient just because of economies of scale. Obviously, there's many other areas where, you know, the private sector does dominate and should dominate. So again, I would say um, it depends on how those public or private companies are managed. Um, and it also depends on the nature of the business, whether there is a rationale for having uh, some public sector involvement. Mm -hmm. So th that's very interesting, Steve. And you're just moving ahead on the conversation. You know, like uh, you've also made a very important proposition uh, in your uh, writings, and that is that the real world markets are like institutions. But mm -hmm. there have been some uh, different kind of thinking uh, in this area. Uh, there they could be people who think differently from different fields. Like how, how is this field really a build up? Well, what is it that people are thinking? How are you really bringing a new proposition to this? And so on and so forth. Well, by arguing that markets are institutions, I really am arguing against kind of the market liberal worldview that sees governments and markets in opposition, that assumes that there is something like a free market, that sees government as an arena of constraint and the market as an arena of freedom. I'm saying kind of like I was saying a moment ago that all markets are governed, right? And so if you understand a real world market, you have to think about the laws and regulations, the business practices and the social norms, right? That make that market work the way it is. And one way to think about this intuitively I think is if you think about a market in the abstract, then what I'm saying is very hard, it's very hard to wrap your head around. Like, what does that mean, right? 
But if you, if you make it concrete, I think it becomes obvious quite quickly. So in other words, if we go from talking about a market in the abstract, let's talk about a specific market. Let's talk about the market for search engines, right? And then you think about, right, this is not an abstract market, it's a real market that exists in the United States and we have a dominant player, Google, right? And, and so there's kind of like a status hierarchy within that market, right? It has almost like a social structure, right? And obviously there's formal rules, right? The laws about competition, um, the laws about financial disclosure, regulations that are in any market, right? There's also a series of business practices, right? The kinds of, you know, some anti-competitive practices, the way that Google might shut out its competitors, the way it might um, punish companies in a way, right? Um, that cross it, right? So that's part, that's, that, that's how that market works, right? It's not an abstraction. Um, it's a very tangible uh, field defined by formal laws, business practices, relationships, right? Between a huge incumbent and lots of mini challengers, right? And the informal norms that govern that relationship. So as you go from looking at markets as abstractions to kind of concrete, particularly if you, if you break it down to a sector, you know, like the auto market, right? Or the retail market, then you see that it really has um, some governing principles and a social structure. Um, and that's the way that I think we should study real markets, right? I mean, you, you know, economists uh, uh, study them in an in abstraction. Sometimes that can be incredibly useful. But if your goal is to try to understand the real markets that we experience you know, in the real world, then I think we have to look at the very specific you know, institutions that define that market. So Stephen, like when you, when you talk about institutions and things, and you're of course talking about how regulation happens, but there is always this danger uh, that you can lead to over-regulation and control. And when you were talking about an example of Google, uh, I would like, like to see an example of say, uh, Facebook or Twitter, wherein they're also trying to self-regulate and they end up impinging on rights of a few sets of people. Uh, how would you really uh, look at that in that case? Because if, if there is self-regulation uh, or uh, the, the technology companies are saying that, that we are gonna self-regulate, it can actually cause some uh, bad decisions as well. Great, yeah, so let me separate a couple of issues. First, um, I would say that arguing that all markets are governed does not logically lead us to the conclusion that they should be over-governed, right? Um, it's just a recognition that that is our reality, right? That they're always gonna be governed, whether it be by the private sector or by the government, right? And so what I'm advocating for is not regulation is always good, more is always better. What I'm advocating for is not more regulation, but better regulation. And in order to get better regulation, we have to realize how the, that market, let's say, is governed in the, in the present, right? In other words, we can't compare our policy prescription to the free market because that free market doesn't exist. You compare your proposal to the real world market that as I suggested earlier is probably um, you know, sullied with collusion and fraud and, and imbalances of power. Um, so that's one question, right? You know, is, is, is how much regulation? And there I would just very, you know, openly concede that you can have too much as well as too little. Then there's the question that you mentioned, which is, you know, self-regulation versus is, is, uh, public regulation. And there, I think that, that that only underlines my point because the absence of public regulation means de facto private sector regulation. And what we're seeing with big tech is we have these companies that are in a sense running their own marketplaces. So there is a market regulator, there's a, there's a market um, architecture that is created not by the government, but by the firm itself, right? Um, and so that um, you know, can be um, a real problem in terms of public policy, right? Because in a sense, um, the, there's a private player that's getting to set the rules and then other companies are having to compete with the market architect, with the platform itself. And then finally, there's another problem that you're alluding to, which is that, um, that 
they can be, uh, you know, particularly in the case of something like Facebook, you know, they're also, they're information platforms. Um, and so they're regulating, you know, they're kicking Donald Trump off of Twitter or whatever, right? Um, and in a sense, um, from a legal standpoint, they have a right to do that because they're, they're private. They're not, a, it's not a public, uh, public arena. Um, but it does raise the issue of, you know, where, how much um, power should they be given to regulate their own marketplace or should the public authorities come in and say, you know, you have to, you have to abide by our rules even in the way that you manage your marketplace. So how do we really set this right? Because you made a very important point here that when Donald Trump was pushed off uh, the Twitter platform, uh, because it also undermines democratic processes in certain ways. Uh, was it right? There, there were people who were happy, but it leads us to a larger question and that is whether it is a sensible thing to do, whether governments have the right to say that, of course it's a private property, but they've eventually become public goods at this point in time. Like Twitter is more like a public good. Facebook is more like a public good. So who regulates is going to be an important question. And uh, it possibly undermines democracy in many, many ways because you're suddenly taking away a right of an individual uh, to say something right or wrong, but you have the rights. So um, I'm not particularly sad to be missing Donald Trump's tweets. Um, but you do raise, uh, you raise an important point, which is right, even those of us who are very uncomfortable with the way that he used that platform, you know, wonder whether, um, you know, people should be just um, thrown off um, as, as, as much as we may not like what they say. Um, so I, you know, I don't have a, a complete answer for you, um, but I do think that as these um, big tech platforms start to take on kind of public utility functions, you know, we have to think about regulating them as public utilities. So that, uh, that is obviously in terms of antitrust policy, but also in terms of, you know, uh, of how we think about free speech. And obviously I don't think that free speech should ever be, um, 100%. I mean, there are certain, you know, there should, there, there, there are certain limits, right? Um, you know, hate speech or whatever. So I'm not saying, but we do, we do need to keep um, an open marketplace of ideas. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would say that I think uh, while I'm concerned about that issue, I think that we have maybe even more urgent issues with uh, regulation of big tech. Um, with, you know, because they, in terms of market regulation, um, because they are both creating a platform and competing with other, you know, so I think that has to be addressed. Then there's the data and privacy issues that have to be addressed. And then there's the free speech ideas. And the tricky thing with these big tech platforms is I don't think you can actually separate out each of those. You have to think about them in an interactive way. And my second point being that, that your, your antitrust policy will affect your data uh, regulation policy and vice versa. So it's a complex problem, but it's big enough um, that obviously the governments of the world are gonna have to move on this pretty quickly. It's a huge debate obviously in the United States, but I know uh, that's true in India and I know that's true in Europe as well. So that, that, that's very fascinating and interesting. And, but then, you know, like we're getting into a very interesting conversation in which is saying uh, there are these ideas of government versus markets uh, that is actually coming up. Uh, how, how do you really solve that problem or solve that issue uh, that we can actually see all the time? And I would leave it back to one of your very important points that you would actually said, and that was that, you, you know, like everything is governed here, whether we talk about societal norms and whatever. Uh, because it also clashes with the societal norms at points in time. Uh, how, how do you really look at this proposition? Um, what that that government regulation clashes with social norms, or in what yes, sense do you mean the government regulation clashes with social norms at points in time? 
I mean, the way I think about this in the book is, is kind of, as I suggested, I see three pillars. There's the, the formal government regulation, laws and regulations. Um, there's business practices and private sector standards. And then there's social norms and beliefs. And that kind of moves from public to private and from formal to informal. And so, yes, you can have um, you can have tension between those different different levels, right? Um, and that can be one of the most fascinating things to study is to look at cases where um, you know the government regulation and the social norms are um, in in tension with each other. Um, for instance, in the Japan book that you mentioned, Japan Remodel, in a sense, that's one of the things I was studying is how. When the, when the Japanese government would try to, they basically you know, were trying to emulate the American liberal market model and I argue they failed. And part of it was because of that clash between the government regulations and the social norms and the business practices. In other words, you can kind of take some American laws and you can bring them in to Japan, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna operate in the same way. So at least from an analytical standpoint, we have to really understand that, that tension uh, between um, the, what's happening at the government level and what's happening in, you know, on the ground. Um, and I think that's why you know, a conversation like the one we're having is so important because you, you, you can't understand politics without understanding business and you can't understand business without understanding politics. And part of that is understanding, right, uh, the tension, right, between some formal law or regulation and what's actually happening on the ground. Um, and, um, and they move by different dynamics, right? I mean, you can pass a law, um, you know, and that'll be, a, the, you'll have a new law in, you know, in a month. Politically, it's not easy, but technically you can do that, right? But that doesn't mean that you're gonna change the way the logic of the marketplace works in that particular country. Very interesting, uh, Steve. And but of course, this moving ahead on this, like uh, you you have said that you need to have different regulatory standards for different sets of markets. Uh, and then, of course, you have alluded to uh, something like how social media or how tech companies should actually be looked at. But how do you really look at resource-based industries? Because when I talk about resource-based industries, they, they've always had this issue of being exploitative extracting more than what is required. They can actually have effects or impacts on the ground, on populations, uh, because that, that also can have a huge detrimental impact on how the world functions. And especially given the whole climate crisis that we are really talking about. So we can talk about petroleum, mining, minerals, and so on and so forth. So the, the resource-based industries. Well, there's a lot there's a lot to say there. Um, and just to take a step back, one way I think about when I try to like sort out what I mean by regulation, one of the first um, ways I try to separate out different categories is to think about economic regulation versus social regulation. So economic regulation would be like market regulation, like we were talking about earlier, entry, um, uh, prices, um, antitrust, and social regulation would be like health, environmental safety, right? And so each of these arenas has a, a kind of a different logic to it. It's a different type of regulation. Um, I'm making all of that point because if you think about what are the distinctive features of resource-based industries, one is that they have probably less need for market type regulations. Like if you compare, compare them to finance, for example, right? Um, and much higher need for um, social regulation. I mean, there's, there's, there's huge, obviously, environmental issues, um, health and safety issues, right? So the need for that kind of regulation is higher, whereas the need for more kind of uh, market-related regulation is less. Now, that's just a gross generalization. If we're going to push further, right, there's exceptions to what I just said. For example, um, I just uh, wrote a story about the Texas electricity fiasco. Um, and that's, an, if you think about electricity markets, in a sense, is the opposite of what I just said. If you want to create a market in electricity, it's an incredibly complex market regulation. It's, a, it's the epitome of a market that would not create itself, right? You can't just say, oh, let's go outside and trade some electricity with each other. No, 
it, it creates an, it, 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 a very consciously um, fabricated apparatus mm -hmm. with some real experts. I mean, you've got to get some some expertise just to make the just to make the market work at all, and to make it market work well is incredibly complex. That's why we had these crises in California, um, in Texas, et cetera. Um, so that's, you know, that's also related to resource base because obviously the electricity comes from somewhere in, in Texas, it comes largely uh, from gas. Um, so, you know, it, it really depends on what specific market we're talking about. I mean, in a way that returns to, to the earlier point which is you have to understand what's the dynamic of that particular market. What are the kinds of regulations? What is it governed by, right? Um, and obviously in the case of resource industries, you also have often, you know, geopolitics, right? Is a bigger part of the governance of those markets as opposed to something that's, that's very local. Um, so you have to look at it as holistically. And then you also have to look um, even, right? Even within resource based, um, you know, the way that you, uh, the way that oil markets work versus electricity um, is, is, is quite different. And Steve, like, I have to ask you this question because when you're making a proposition that we have to govern uh, the markets, there has to be a right regulation, but it leads to a very fundamental point, And that is, how do we define markets? How do we define a particular market? Like, because if you're really talking about electricity, so is electricity generation one market, distribution is another market, or how would you do that? Because if we fundamentally don't answer that question, we can really go horribly wrong in creating the right regulation as well. I mean, I tend to think um, of markets holistically. Um, my sister is a geographer and we wrote this um, story about the Texas power market together. And so we, uh, your question is a great one because we had a little tension between each other on that because I think because she's a geographer, she, she was looking at, at markets uh, in a circumscribed way. And particularly people who study the electricity markets, they try to, they tend to focus on one specific market. Like there's a day before market or a, a real time market. And those are, like I said, literally fabricated markets. They're like auctions, right? But in my mind, perhaps my perverted mind, because I've, I've started to believe my own rhetoric, um, I see it holistically, right? Um, because that, that real, that daytime market is, is embedded in a larger market system. And, and that's why I keep talking in terms of regulations and business practices and norms. Um, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't be precise, you know, at any given moment, we can say we're talking about that that market in that limited limited sense of a particular auction, um, but for me, that's always embedded in a larger institutional environment. Um, one way to think about it is if you think about just think about it for a moment, like an economist, right? That, that ultimately there's a price and there's an exchange. Um, now, an economist might say because there's a price and an exchange, we can just we can kind of just circumcise. Let's just look at that auction moment, right? And we've got some bidders and we've got some, uh, we've got some sellers and some buyers and, you know, and it matches and you have an exchange. But what I'm saying is, but if you really want to understand the market, you kind of have to blow up the whole picture, right? Because you have to look at what, um, what are the norms, right? Where was the, where were they trained, right? Where did they study economics, right? Who gave them an idea about like their bidding strategies? Not to mention the power relationships between them. Not to mention the politics, right? They created the rules. Does that make sense, right? And so even if you're ultimately, even if you're ultimately your your, your interest, let's say hypothetically, was in how how those prices got formed, I would argue that if you want to understand it in a real world market, right, as opposed to a theoretical sense, right? If you want to say like, how did this really happen? You would actually have to look at all of the, you'd have to look at how, another way to say this is, you'd have to understand how markets are embedded in politics and society, right? And how would you, so that's interesting. How is markets embedded in politics and society? But 
is politics a market or not is going to be another question that i have to ask you so would you say political market or i would really want to say look at it um i mean politics is a competition for sure right um and and politicians so you could um i think i would resist it because i think politics has its own logic and 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 maybe is better studied uh if well, let's put it this way. If we took the market analogy, you know, you could find some insights into politics, but you also might overshoot, right? You might miss the, the part, the elements of politics that aren't really about markets. You know, they're about persuasion and, and debate um, and, um, and mobilization and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, it, in some ways, um, I wouldn't fight that one too hard because, you know, these are analytical tools. And so if the market analogy helps you, great. I just would just, just might not take that too far. But, um, but the opposite, I would argue, I think more strenuously, which is that markets are always political, right? And I mean that in the sense that, that markets are, are, are laden with power, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take the relationship between an employer and employee and you think how are wages, right? right? Wages are at least partly the product, you might say, well, it has to do with scarcity, right? Again, that would be the stripped down economic, you know, who has exit options? Um, how many different employers are there? How many different employees are they? But I would say, but very quickly, it starts to hinge on power, right? Um, in other words, um, how much political power, for example, do the workers have? How much political power do the employers have? What's the status, right? Is there some sort of um, class distinction between them? Is there some sort of racial ethnic decision, right? Which means that the employees, right? You know, is, there, is it a society in which there's discrimination, which means that the, um, the employees don't have as many options. It's not, it's not a free market for them because they only have certain, right? Um, or do they have lower status because they don't actually have citizenship? Uh, those things, you know, if you want to say again, if you want to say what's the wage, it's a fact. That's what I'm when I say markets are embedded in politics, society. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the, those wages are the product not only of supply and demand, but of the social relationships and the politics, right? Um, and even let's say you think, oh well, um, I'm not, I'm not hiring um, non-citizens. So I'm a good employer so that Vogel's theory about society and politics doesn't apply to me. But I would say no, right? Because the, your competitor maybe, maybe you don't hire undocumented workers, but your competitor does, right? And so that's part of their competitive advantage and you're trying to respond to that, right? And the labor market itself is affected by, um, by the variable social status of the different groups of workers, right? Or if you look at the United States, um, the difference between the labor market in the South versus the North and how they, how they affect each other. Um, again, I'm not an expert on India, but I, I, I know enough to know that there's huge variation across states within India, right? And those affects, right, the national market, the interaction, the interaction between local markets embedded in particular social and political characteristics kind of with each other you know, forged into a national market. All of that really matters for, for prices, not to mention our, our lifestyles. So, Steve, I have to ask you this question and I'm compelled. Uh, you, you, you might want to answer it. If you don't want to, you can just discard it. But I have to ask you this question. Uh, you know, like there is this ticket to heaven market that we really talk about. Uh, and the ticket to heaven market would mean like the, the market for religion. Uh, and today we, it is competition, of course, to what you want to believe in. If I really apply your aspect to it, like you have competition between Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, or whatever. But there is huge clash of ideas. And this competition, probably it seems that uh, the world is uh, looking at a lot of toxic thing around this, uh, and which is very annoying. Uh, you know, like, uh, I think religion was not made it to be that way. It was more made to be something which was keeping people together, being respectful. But suddenly there is this toxicity that is there. So how, how do you really look at that? If, if you want to answer this question, 
Well, I'm not sure I have, you know, kind of any specific insights into that. I would, I mean, I would say we're at a very populist moment and, and, and I would say that, you know, unfortunately human history has a long track record of various versions of tribalism, right? Mm -hmm. Of saying, my people are different from your people. And that gets grafted on top of religion, of course, you know, but sometimes those differences are ethnic, sometimes they're religious. Um, but that kind of instinct for, for tribalism is very powerful. And what's both interesting and horrifying is that um, I think our current moment um, is a reminder that history does not only work in one direction, right? You know, we would like to think that we're becoming a more, whatever, more enlightened, more tolerant society over time. And there's certainly um, things we can look at, you know, to say, this is wonderful, we're moving in that right direction. But there's also some things we can look at and say, this is horrifying. We're not, we're actually not just not making progress. We're actually going backward. We're becoming more tribal. We're becoming um, um, more xenophobic. Um, and so I'm not sure I would blame religion. I would just say that, that religion becomes uh, a, a horrifying tool when, uh, when put into the wrong hands, right? Um, and um, I think, you know, most of the world religions have, uh, you know, have, have a wonderful side, but they also have people who use that religion to separate, right? To distinguish. Absolutely. Um, and we all have to stay vigilant because we can see it happening, right? And like I said, we can, we can actually see in some areas very clear signs of negative progress, right? Of, of regression, of, back, of backlash. Um, and I don't, you know, yeah, I don't have any special expertise or solution, but, but we sure have to fight that or else we're all in trouble. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with you on that. And but having said that, you know, you know, let's go back to something very interesting in your book. You, you mentioned there are core propositions. There are 10 core propositions that you really talk about. Uh, so how do you really come up with this whole idea of core propositions? There are 10 principles that you follow. Uh, what do you think would be the most important if you're really looking at regulation, creating a regulation? What is it that we should really keep in mind from a policymaker's uh, perspective. You have, you've touched upon some of those ideas as we were really going about, but if you have to say it for the policymaker. Um, so the way I came up with that is that I started, uh, and, and I think we kind of alluded to this at the beginning, that there's kind of a, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an element of the argument that is obvious, and there's kind of an element of the argument that is totally not obvious or kind of, uh, cuts against the grain of kind of everything that you learn in a standard economics class. And so I was toying with that tension between, you know, what seems like a fairly common sense and yet somewhat radical argument at the same time. And so the propositions was my way of working through it logically. And so I start with the proposition that there's no free market, right? And I say, well, if there's no free market, then that means all markets are governed. And I think, um, I would hope that most people would kind of go with me that far. Um, but then I say, if that's true, then that means that market reform is actually a, a constructive process. Um, and hopefully here's where I can also address your question about policy. So that's where this kind of argument that seems sort of obvious, right? Which is that there's no actual free market that all markets have to be governed. If you take that and you push the logic of that, you reach some conclusions that A, are maybe less obvious and B, have very specific policy ramifications. And so to illustrate the point I'm trying to make, let me just take the idea of market reform. What is, you know, we've, all of our countries have been through a period of market reform over recent decades, but what does that really mean? If you took the kind of the laissez-faire free market, you know, government versus market worldview, then it's pretty clear what it means. It means that there is this thing towards the free market, which may or may not exist, but it certainly exists as a goal. You want to move towards the free market. 
And in order to move toward the free market, what do you need to do? You need to get rid of everything that's in your way. So market reform is a process fundamentally of removing barriers to markets. I mean, that is, that is the standard kind of worldview behind decades of market reform. And I'm saying that's wrong, right? And you can see the assumptions of this worldview in the language we use. What do we call those reforms? We don't usually use market reform. The words we use are privatization, liberalization, deregulation. Now, what do those words connote, right? What do they mean? They mean getting rid of stuff, liberating markets. But if you take the market craft worldview, then liberalizing markets is not liberating. Right? If you want more competition, you have to create it. If you want more dynamic markets, that means more regulation, not less. More government, not less. So it kind of flips the conventional wisdom on its head. And what I try to argue is that there are ramifications for how we analyze the world and there are ramifications for policy. And that this worldview has led us to misunderstand political economy, and it's led us to all kinds of policy errors. So again, to be concrete, if we just take, let's take the developing world, right? The Washington consensus, as it is called, is very much reflects this worldview. You know, tell governments to stop doing what they're doing, right? And the, the market, what I call the market institutional perspective has a very different an analysis and a very different prescription. Right? So the market liberal view would say, what's the problem? The government is doing too much. What's the answer? Have it do less, right? Less regulation, less um, trade restrictions, less protection. Then you can be a nice capitalist country and you can get rich too. Um, and, but the market institutional says the problem in a poor country is not too much government, it's too little government, right? It's the lack of capacity of the government to govern markets effectively. And because of that, you have less investment, right? You have less private sector dynamism because you don't have um, properly governed markets, right? Nobody trusts that they'll ever get their money back. So they don't put it in in the first place, right? Or in a developing country, often you say, well, why go back to your question about uh, government and business. Why is the government running the electric system in a certain country, right? The answer is, is deceptively obvious. It's because nobody else will, right? I mean, if you don't have a market infrastructure, there is no private entrepreneur crazy enough to make that kind of a investment because they're not gonna get their money back, right? So it's not that the government is power hungry, it's that the government is too weak to create the institutional infrastructure in which private entrepreneurs would, would invest. So I've gotten a little bit long-winded, but I'm trying to get back to your question about policy implications, right? Is that, is that the worldview of market liberalism versus kind of this market craft view, you know, it, 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 it assesses the problem very differently and it comes up with very different policy solutions. Just to flip to the, to the rich world, um, you could, and I was talking about policy errors, I think you could take the whole global financial crisis and you could analyze it as a catastrophic failure of market craft, right? In other words, it was bad market governance. Um, and I would argue that that bad government market governance was fundamentally rooted in a worldview, in a neoliberal or market liberal worldview. And there's, there's this wonderful episode when Alan Greenspan, right? who is one of the architects of those policies is pressed in a congressional hearing. It was your ideology, right? That believed in free markets, that thought that markets could govern themselves well. That's what created the financial crisis. And Greenspan confesses and he says, yes, I found a flaw. And so my point is, I don't wanna blame the whole thing on Greenspan, but my point is that some of the failures of US-based financial regulation were rooted in an ideology that gave too much tr trust in free markets, too much faith in private sectors, and didn't really look at 
um, financial regulation not as a problem of minimizing regulation, but of one of crafting effective market systems. I would argue that if the authorities had viewed it that way, they would not have made that same series of mistakes that led to the financial crisis. And, but on your, in your view, uh, Steve, uh, do you think we are in danger of making governments too strong and uh, too intrusive at points in time? Because if governments are create, regulating the markets, that there is always a danger that they can actually have undue power that might actually happen. Then they have this ability to control, which becomes too high. Uh, and it might actually come in the way of, say, uh, innovation, growth at points in time? Absolutely. Yeah, so there I go back to my earlier answer that, that by, I'm just trying to highlight that markets are always governed. They're going to be governed. And so we should think of, we should understand that. We should think about that. And we should try to design that market governance to be as effective as possible for public welfare broadly defined. Is there a danger of overregulation? Of course. But understanding that markets are governed does not, does not lead you towards that path any more than anything else does. Right? In fact, I would argue it probably is going to help you avoid overregulation because you'll understand right, the place of regulation within the broader market governance ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not denying the, the, the danger that you mentioned, but, but I don't think there's anything about this market craft worldview that's going to lead you that way anymore. Um, and so, and sometimes a market craft solution might actually mean less government. Like if we take financial markets, I mean, you could make financial regulation infinitely more and more complex, but I don't think that the market craft lens necessarily leads you to that. You might say, well, how about a much simpler solution, like a structural solution where you go back to Glass-Steagall and you have different kinds of financial uh, markets. Or maybe it would lead you to advocate a financial transactions tax, right? Instead of very detailed um, uh, supervision and incredible, you know, you could replace a lot of that with some simple um, solutions. So again, I'm not saying necessarily more, I'm saying better. Um, and, and, um, and yes, you have to be attuned to the possibility that governments are going to over intervene. But again, and, and there's another in, in, example of government capacity. If you have a relatively capable and autonomous bureaucracy, I don't think that necessarily leads to an overbearing one, right? Hopefully that, that you know, uh, that would be one that would be maybe more prudent, right? That would know, understand its own limits. That's certainly what we would have to work towards, right? And in doing so, we have to continually be vigilant. So, but Steve, just a curious question, because what, what you said is that bureaucracy is going to be independent and things, uh, but then bureaucracy also tends to uh, become very strong over a period of time, or they would want to assert power into their own hands. Uh, and then they, they, they could actually become overbearing. Uh, so you, you have to solve that problem as well. So you, you have to have, what you're saying is, we need to have institutions across the board which function exactly the way they have to function. I'm not saying it's easy. Um, in terms of the relationship between bureaucrats and politicians, it's true, I'm a kind of a fan of bureaucracy. I realize that's, uh, that's kind of counter all trends in most countries. Everybody loves to beat up on bureaucrats. But where would be we? Where would we be without them, right? Um, and and in fact, you know, if they're better trained and better compensated, they're probably less likely to be corrupt and probably less likely to be overbearing and kind of power hungry. So what we need, and this again, this is not easy, but is an ideal, is you need the proper balance between political leadership and and bureaucracy. Um, I would simply argue that um, while um, giving too much power to bureaucrats is certainly dangerous, 
giving too much power to politicians is not such a great idea either, right? Um, and so what you really need is an effective bureaucracy that's relatively insulated so that they can think about things in the long term. But you also need accountability to politicians so that if the bureaucrats get too power hungry or they move in a to our direction, the, pol the political leadership could rein them in. So it's, a, you know, it's an appropriate balance between, between those two. But unfortunately, many of our countries don't, you know, don't achieve that. Um, and I have to ask you this. Uh, if I'm looking at a metric which says that we are going into the right direction, what would be that metric that you, we should measure? Uh, if you really say that we have to talk about governance of market uh, and creating the right regulation and things, so there must be some metric that we would have to use. Uh, how, what would that metric be? It's a great question, and I'm going to be honest with you. I don't answer that question really in the book because the book is about um, it's is trying to offer a set of analytical tools about how we understand markets, and it's not giving a strong prescriptive answer. But the answer to the question is uh, this may seem like a dodge, but I don't think it is. Is that you have to decide what you want first. Right, and what your goals are. And depending on those goals, you have to try to um, craft market governance that achieves those goals. So the easy part of your answer is what it's not, right? The metric would not simply be GDP, right? That's, you know, the, that's the metric that many of our countries are targeting. And I think, I'm not saying it's useless, but I'm saying focusing too narrowly on GDP has been a mistake for many countries. Right? Um, the second thing it would not be is the stock market. And certain, um, I mean, I, I study Japan, the United States and Japan, these are countries where our leaders have been obsessed with trying to craft policies that will kind of keep the stock market alive. I think that's also not what we should be looking at. So um, just like many other people, I am, I'm, I'm kind of, enthralled by the various attempts to come up with something, uh, some other set of metrics like a human development index um, or other, um, other types of indices, right? Metrics that would create a more, are, are more holistic. But the truth is, you know, it depends on what your problems and on your goals are. And so in the current moment, for example, I think we have to think about the, you know, the future of our planet. And so, a, uh, I would, uh, you know, I would downgrade GDP as a goal more than I would have 10 or 20 years ago, because we've got some bigger problems. Um, and I would upgrade, you know, progress on, on the climate. Um, and so that would have to be part. I think also um, another thing that we have to think about is distribution. And again, I think it has to do with the moment, right? At least in the United States right now, inequality is just skyrocketing. Um, and I think it's gotten to the point where it is detrimental to the legitimacy of our regime, both politically and economically. And so, you know, in terms of goals, I would upgrade progress on environmental issues. I would upgrade, you know, a, a trying to create um, a market governance system that creates more equitable growth. And I think there are very specific policy implications of the market craft perspective, because what it points you towards is what some people in the United States call pre-distribution. In other words, instead of focusing on redistribution, you think more fundamentally, what is it about the market governance system that creates this inequality? And then you try, uh, and so the market craft agenda kind of focuses more on the micro policies like corporate governance, labor regulation, financial regulation, that create the basis for a fairer and more dynamic market, right? That would give fair returns uh, to workers, right? And decent prices for consumers and not just astronomical returns for CEOs and corporations. And so what, what you're really saying is that we have to bring, what I, I say all the time is that bring social objectives and economic objectives together, go beyond GDP or GDP is not destiny. It is actually about social progress that we have to really talk about. Uh, in Absolutely. Fact, 
so that that's where it is. In fact, uh, I would request you to look at the index that I created uh, in India called the Social Progress India for India, uh, wherein we actually look at exactly non-GDP factors that matter, and yeah. they probably really pick up from your ideas in uh, many many ways. And but then, as we are coming to the uh, close of the conversation, uh, Steve, like just a very quick question: uh, anything that you would like to suggest uh, for individuals? Uh, in terms of like what they should read, how they should imbibe this principle in their day-to-day -day thinking and uh, how, how to really understand regulation and things. A few fundamental points. Um, all right, I'll, I'll answer that maybe in two completely different ways. One is I uh, just building on what I was just saying is that I think that the, that the market craft policy agenda is something that we should all be thinking about more. It's, you know, when we say, do we want capitalism or not? I, I, my, I would rephrase that question and, and I would say, what capitalism do we want, right? Because there's a million different, there's a million different kinds of capitalism and, you know, it, and it can be good or bad. We, if, if, if markets are free, let's put it this way, right? If markets are free, then we have no agency, right? We just decide whether, you know, it's like a butterfly. Do we let it go or do we not? But that's completely false. We make markets. Markets are social constructions, right? That means that we created them. That means that we can craft them better, right? Um, so I guess that, you know, that's the thought I might try to, to, to leave uh, your viewers and listeners with, is that we have agency. I mean, maybe not individually, but collectively, we have agency and we can decide how we want to craft these markets. And if we say, well, these markets create incredible inequality, that's because we, we designed them that way, right? If we say they create destruct, they destroy our planet, well, that's because we designed them that way, right? And so we can design better markets and we should. And just, just curious question, like two or three books that you think everybody should read or you, you think that, that have had a great influence on you and your thinking. Um, so, well, I'm, you know, I mostly study Japan, but right now I've been studying the U.S., so my, my book list might be a little U.S.-centric, but I'll just throw it out anyway. Um, one book is, uh, that I think would be super helpful is Heather Bushy's Unbound. It's about inequality in the United States. Um, she has just joined Biden's uh, Council of Economic Advisors. So it's relevant because this is some of the thinking that's going to animate the Biden administration. But it's a great review of kind of recent economic research and it shows you how kind of the field of economics has evolved. And you know some basic things, like we used to think that there was a trade-off between inequality and growth. And she's arguing based on a lot of economic research, actually it's the other way around, inequality undermines growth, right? Um, or, um, uh, if we're going political science, um, my colleague um, Paul Pearson and um, Jacob Hacker have a series of books, but the latest is called Let Them Eat Tweets, and it's about kind of American plutocracy. Like, how did we get in the situation where we have a Republican Party that um, passes all kinds of policies that are unpopular, that are designed really to enrich the rich, right? And, you know, how can they do that? and still win elections, right? It's a puzzle, which they kind of take on very nicely. And since I'm trying to be interdisciplinary, so that's economics, uh, political science, let's end with sociology. I just read this book by Jake Rosenfeld um, called You Are, uh, basically, I forget the exact phrasing, but you're paid what you're worth and other myths of the modern economy. And it's about wage formation, you and I were just talking about. But he takes looks at it from a sociological point of view and he says, let's look at how wages are formed, not in theory, but how does it really happen, right? And that's fascinating because, uh, because if you look at managers and how they actually set wages, it's not based on some kind of technical uh, market. Um, it, you know, he looks at, a lot of it has to do with power, as I was saying earlier, but it also has to do with norms of equity, right? Which vary across space. Um, it also has to do with, you know, kind of, kind of simple, um, uh, part of it has to do with inertia, right? Whatever has been done, that you, you just keep doing it, right? So, so kind of kind of social customs. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to kind of go from the, the realm of big theory to say, well, okay, but 
How Are Wages Actually Set? Um, so those are some books that I've really enjoyed recently and you know, each one in its kind of different way um, has made me think. And, and I'm a huge fan of interdisciplinary political economy. I think we learn a lot from each other, meaning you know, economists, political scientists, sociologists, historians, geographers, et cetera, because each of these different vantage points has something to offer. Great, Steve. This has just been such a such a great interaction. I think I just learned so much. Uh, we could have talked on for a longer time, uh, but I do hope I'm able to catch up with you in person sometime soon when travel is allowed. And next time I'm in uh, the Bay Area, uh, I hope we can have a cup of coffee together. But uh, thanks great. a lot I, for uh, well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was such an honor. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. You. Be well. Be safe. Be safe. God bless. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.